Y'all can have a seat. <clears throat> well, good morning. As Kate shared, my name is Mark, and I am on staff with Crew, which is the college ministry of Providence Church. Uh, if you call uh, Providence Church your home church, welcome. As, if you're new, if this is your first time, your second time, you're just kind of checking out what we are all about, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Our hope and our prayer is that you would experience the love, the presence, and the truth of who Jesus is in everything, everything that we do, from the responsive reading to the worship through singing to the giving to now the teaching of uh, God's Word. If you are new, we've been in a series uh, entitled Doctrine. Exploring Life's Biggest Questions. That word doctrine, it means a collection of beliefs. In our case, we've been exploring doctrine, not just in the context of the Christian faith in general, but specifically doctrine as it relates to Providence Church. What does Providence Church believe about a whole host and variety of issues and topics related to the Christian faith? And so we've talked, for example, about the doctrine of God. What does it mean that God is Trinity, that somehow he's both three in one, that he's singular, and yet he's also triune? We talked about the doctrine of Scripture. Phil last week spoke about this. What do we mean when we say that the Bible is both authoritative and also inerrant or free from error? This week, we continue by discussing the doctrine of man. The doctrine of man is a term that theologians use to describe both the creation of humanity, but also the nature of humanity before and after the fall. In the year 2006, Katie Piper was an aspiring model. Born and raised in Winchester, England, she moved to London in her early 20s to pursue a career. Around that time, she met a man by the name of David Lynch. They began dating. Early on, David was the perfect gentleman. They went out several times. They laughed. They flirted. They enjoyed each other's company. His interest in Katie, however, quickly turned toxic, manipulative, and abusive. After just two short weeks, Katie broke it off. Heartbroken, And infuriated, David did the unthinkable. He hired a hitman to throw a cup of sulfuric acid across Katie's face. Immediately, Katie was rushed to the hospital, induced in a 12-day coma, and underwent extensive skin graft surgery. Over the course of the next decade, Katie would undergo nearly 200 procedures. In the aftermath of the attack, Katie shared she was horrified by the reflection of her own image, refused to look in mirrors, convinced that she would never recover, never find love again. I share Katie's story because there's a sobering spiritual parallel. In the beginning, God created humanity. Beautifully, wonderfully, fearfully. We were the pinnacle of God's creative grandeur. But tragically, the acid of sin was thrown in Genesis chapter 3. Such that now the image is still there, but it's distorted. The image is still there, but it's damaged. The image is still there, but the effects of sin are unmistakable. Beautifully designed, yet also tragically flawed. This is a tension that you and I need to hold as we move throughout our morning. A tension that if we're not careful, we'll reject and swing the pendulum too far in either direction. That either We're so sinful, we're so wretched, we're so depraved, we're not worthy of redemption. Or we're just completely fine the way we are and in not not need 
of redemption. Scripture offers to us a different image, an image that I believe is more honest and more beautiful because in the end, it points us to the ultimate redeemer of our humanity, Jesus Christ himself. The doctrine of man, beautifully designed yet also tragically flawed. God, would you meet us here right now? The task before us, it is weighty. It is significant. Would you draw close? Would you reveal to us your truth? But do so in grace and in gentleness. We ask that you'd quiet out any distractions that might inhibit us from hearing from you. We pray all this. In your beautiful and powerful name, Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis 1 to 3, we're given the creation account. It is this beautiful and poetic explosion of God's infinite power and creativity. That out of nothing, God creates the cosmos. Out of nothing, God creates the heavens and the earth. Earth is brimming with life and vegetation landscapes, oceans, animals, and ultimately humanity, male and female, in God's image. And then, fast forward a few thousand years in the book of Exodus, the first tabernacle is built. Have you ever considered, what if there was a connection between the two? What might Eden humanity's first home, and the tabernacle, this semi-permanent structure built after Israel's rescue from Egypt, have to do with each other? And what might they have to do with our topic, the doctrine of man today? I want to leave that question hanging in our mind, and for the next few moments, take us on a biblical excursion, the tabernacle in Eden, what do they have to do with each other? And what do they have to do with us? In Genesis chapter 2, speaking about Eden, it says, Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. In Exodus 39, speaking about the tabernacle, Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded. Back in Eden, Genesis 1, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Exodus 39, the tabernacle, and Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. Genesis 2, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Exodus 40, then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it in all its furniture so that it may become holy. So far, what have we noticed? In both Eden and the tabernacle, their creation is good. In both Eden and the tabernacle, their creation is complete. And both Eden and the tabernacle, their creation is holy or set apart. In addition, the focal point of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies contained the law, the Ten Commandments. The law was this massive expression of God's wisdom. In a similar way, the focal point of Eden was the tree of knowledge, also this source of of wisdom. There were similarities down to even their geography. The entrance to Eden was from the east. The entrance to the tabernacle also from the east. Even though these two places were separated by thousands of years and hundreds of miles, there were undeniable similarities. That the tabernacle was in some mysterious way this call back to Eden. This call back to an era gone by. Why? For what purpose? There's one more striking similarity that we haven't yet considered. In Genesis 3, verse 8, it says, And they, meaning Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Leviticus 26, the tabernacle, this is God speaking. I will make my dwelling among you. My soul shall not 
abhor you, and I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Eden and the tabernacle were both places of God's intimate dwelling. Eden and the tabernacle were both places where God chose to dwell with us. This is mind-blowing. That the all-knowing, all-infinite, all-powerful God of the universe would set his affection on us and desire to dwell with us. This is a massive and foundational truth we must understand with respect to our humanity. That from the foundation of creation, God designed the world to be connected to you. That even after sin entered the narrative in Genesis chapter 3, that pursuit never stopped. The pursuit was made evident in Eden, made evident in the tabernacle, made evident later still in the temple and finds its ultimate fulfillment in the life and ministry of Jesus. That all throughout the scriptures, God foreshadowed a day when a new tabernacle was coming. A new temple was coming. One not built by human hands, but one that would endure and dwell with his people forever. That should give us tremendous comfort and tremendous hope. One of the deepest longings of the human heart is the desire for intimate an abiding connection. The paradigm of Eden and the paradigm of the tabernacle are tangible proofs that the God of the universe wants to dwell with you. I believe this truth takes on even more profound meaning in the year 2020. We live in this fascinating era of human history. That on the one hand, technology has made it so that we can communicate with anyone at any point at any time. That right now, you could send a message and reach someone on the other side of the globe. Never before in the history of humanity was that so. And yet, we're also discovering that technology has crippled our ability to connect as well. That we're insanely distracted, we're less emotionally present. We're constantly on the go. We're often oblivious to what's happening around us. We've all been in that conversation where every five seconds the other person checks their phone. At what point do you conclude they're here, but they're not here? They're here, but clearly I'm not worth their time. There is tremendous power in both physical and emotional proximity, and you and I intuitively know when we have one, but we don't have the other. Our study of Eden and the tabernacle demonstrates this all-encompassing connection that God wants to have with us. It's physical, emotional, spiritual. It's been hardwired into us, and not just before the fall, but after the fall. So often, when we talk about God's desire for connection, it's pre-fall. I don't know about you, but I hear these sermons, and I read these books, and I think, yeah, but I'm nothing like Adam from Genesis 1 and 2. I'm a mess The tabernacle is this beautiful proof that that pursuit never stopped. His pursuit never waned. God desires to dwell with you. In addition, number two, central to our humanity is the idea that we've been created in God's image. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The weight of this truth is easily lost on our modern ears. In the ancient Near East, kings, they'd often build or erect statues, images, they called them, of themselves all throughout the kingdom. These images were built to convey authority and dominion. The idea was that when one looked upon the statue, when one looked upon the image, they knew the ground beneath their feet belonged to the king. 
Many of us are old enough to remember the capture of ruthless Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein back in 2006. Shortly after his arrest, this picture went viral. The significance of this cannot be understated. This image was not just the destruction of a statue. It was deeply symbolic, communicating that the terror-filled reign of Saddam Hussein was over. When we read that God has made us in his image, that means we've been designed by him to be his ambassadors, representing his interests, bringing his kingdom from heaven to earth. This is a beautiful privilege given solely to the human race. Nothing else in all of creation, not even the angels, bear this responsibility. Specifically, humanity was designed to image God in three distinct ways, as his prophets, as his priests, and as his kings. Genesis 2, 19 reads, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. Adam and Eve, don't miss this, were given kingly authority. They had authority to co-reign with God, to name the animals under their care. In addition, they were to mirror God as priests. To be a priest meant to serve. All throughout the New Testament, when scriptures speak about the priesthood, not only is it an office where you're a mediator, but it is an office of service. Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. I learned this recently from one of my seminary professors. Have you ever considered that Eden, before the fall, was both paradoxically without sin, but also incomplete. So often when we think about Eden pre-fall, we think that God created completed perfection. But if Eden was complete, that would mean that there was no meaningful work for Adam and Eve to do. Isn't it much more likely that Eden, before the fall, more closely resembled a beautiful but rugged, incomplete landscape than some kind of Disneyland completed utopia? This is significant because it speaks to the importance and necessity of Adam and Eve's priestly duties in the garden. Their work mattered, and our work matters. And finally, Adam and Eve, they were to mirror God as prophets. Prophets hear God's word, obey God's word, and speak God's word to others. Genesis 2, 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat, you shall surely die. God spoke to Adam and Eve. He spoke in such a way that they could hear and understand, and already we begin to see their failure in the prophetic role. They heard God's voice, but they did not obey God's voice. And what happened next was the acid of sin was thrown. The offices of prophet and priest and king, they're not eliminated, but they're splintered all throughout the Old Testament. We see the continuation of these offices But they're marked with sin. They're marked with struggle and difficulty and strife. More on that in a minute. But first, let's pause and consider just the collective significance of everything we've said thus far. We've said that we've been designed to dwell with God. That he desires to be present with us. That we're made in his image that we've been designed to be his representatives as as prophets, priests, and kings. Taken together, these truths answer, I believe, two of the most fundamental questions that plague every single person. Number one, does my life have value? Number two, does my life have 
purpose? And the answer to both is a resounding yes. Yes, your life has value because the one who made you longs to be with you. Yes, your life has purpose because the one who made you has given you purpose. He's given you direction. He's given you influence and the opportunity to steward his kingdom in your life. Now, just for a moment, Consider how the competing worldview of materialism, of atheism, answers those two questions. According to atheism, does your life have value? Does your life have purpose? No. Why? Because you, me, everything, and everyone did not come into existence by the hand of a loving creator but by the cosmic collision of three things, impersonal matter, chance, and time. That's how you came into being. Matter, chance, and time. If true, your life has no value. Your life just is. You are here today. You are gone tomorrow. And the universe knows not and cares not about you, any meaning, any value, any purpose that you intrinsically feel, it is an illusion to get you out of bed in the morning. My question is, which worldview, biblical Christianity or materialism, atheism, better accounts for your life experience and mine? Is it possible that our longings for value Our longings for purpose and connection actually point to something outside of just ourselves. Author and philosopher C.S. Lewis writes, The Christian says, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger? Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim? Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire where there's such a thing as sex. All the men are like, amen, praise Jesus. If I find in myself, that was a joke. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I'd argue that our longings for value, our longings for purpose, our longings for meaning are tremendous evidence that the biblical worldview is true. They are tremendous evidence that the God of the Bible exists, that he created you to know him, dwell with him, and live out your purpose in him. We have been beautifully designed. But tragically, as we all know, The story doesn't end there. In Genesis chapter 3, the acid of sin is thrown. The enemy Satan sets the trap. Adam and Eve take the bait. And humanity in many ways has been picking up the pieces ever since. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you 
not to eat. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Three tragic consequences from sin are introduced in this text. Consequences so native to the human experience that you and I cannot fathom an existence without them. Number one, guilt. Notice the way that Adam responds to the direct question from God. Did you eat of the fruit? Instantly, Adam Adam shifts blame. This is a telltale sign of guilt. It wasn't me, it was her. Number two, fear. We're told that Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord because they were afraid. And then third and finally, shame. Adam and Eve were ashamed of their nakedness, and so they covered themselves. This is what sin produces. Sin produces guilt, sin produces fear, and sin produces shame. Sin, first and foremost, it is rebellion against God. And this is where, incidentally, our opening illustration about Katie begins to break down. See, in Katie's case, Katie was the victim of evil committed against her. With respect to sin, yes, at times we are victims of sin, but we're also perpetrators of sin. We're victims in that we are sinned against, but we're also perpetrators in that we willingly sin against God, against ourselves, and against others. I've, I've often heard, and perhaps you have heard this as well, sin described in archery-like terms. The idea is that God's perfection represents the bullseye. The bullseye is his character, his will, his desires for you and for me. Sin is anything outside that bullseye. Sin is missing the mark. I've recently come to realize that in one way, that illustration is helpful, but in another, it is not. It's helpful in that it rightly communicates the perfection of God, but it is unhelpful in that it wrongly assumes that you and I get anywhere close to that perfection with our thoughts, deeds, and actions. If God's perfection is the bullseye, and say, for example, the arrow of my life is an inch or two away, well, then God... I'm doing pretty good. God, my life's not that bad. Scripture, however, paints a far more sobering image of humanity. In Romans chapter 3, Paul writes, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. In keeping with the illustration, a more apt description would be you and me looking at the target, looking at the bullseye with our arrow in hand and then turning around in the complete opposite direction and firing our arrow this way instead. God, I see your word. I see your law. I see what you want for me in this situation, but no, I choose disobedience. This is painful to hear, but can we just be emotionally and intellectually honest for just a moment? Aren't there times when we know exactly what's right, but we willingly choose to do what's wrong because it just feels better in the moment? It feels good to lash out in vindictive anger. It feels good to ignore your spouse and kids. It feels good to make that unwise financial choice. It feels good to spread that juicy piece of gossip. It feels good to act out on those sinful sexual impulses. It just feels good. Sin is less like missing the mark and more like a dye that permeates a pure glass of water. It permeates every aspect of the glass and every aspect of the water. So what can be done? What can be done? This is a seemingly seemingly impossible problem to solve. On the one hand, God has set eternity in our hearts. He set his affections on us. He wants to dwell with us, to empower us as his prophets, priests, and kings. And yet we are infected with sin. It permeates every aspect of the human 
experience. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 that we are dead in our sins and in our trespasses. What can a dead man do to make himself alive? In Galatians 4, Paul writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In Titus 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Jesus is the answer to the seemingly impossible problem of sin. He is our Savior, our Redeemer, the only hope for humanity. Jesus was and is the perfect embodiment of God dwelling with us. In John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. The tabernacle, the temple that we talked about earlier, it was a shadow that ultimately pointed forward to Jesus. See, in the tabernacle, only the priest could enter into the holy of holies and commune with God. But when Jesus breathed his last on the cross, the curtain was torn in two that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple. Translation, because of Jesus, all have access to God through faith. Jesus was the tabernacle. Jesus was the temple. Jesus answered them in John chapter 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, brothers, Hebrews 10, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. In addition, Jesus was the perfect embodiment of prophet and priest and king. Prophets hear God's word, obey God's word, and speak God's word. Jesus' words are true. Jesus' words are authoritative. Jesus' words are perfect. Jesus is also the perfect king. All throughout the Old Testament, Israel was ruled by sinful, selfish kings. And as you read the story, you can't help but cry out, will there ever come a king who will rule with justice and peace? Will there ever come a king who will eradicate evil, who will vindicate the righteous, who will be an advocate for the poor and the marginalized? In Revelation 5, John receives a vision of what's to come. He says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and the sea and all that's in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Jesus is the true and ultimate king. Kings come and kings go. But there is one king to which every other king bows down. And finally, Jesus is the perfect priest. But when Christ appeared as high priest, Hebrews 9, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. 
thus securing an eternal redemption. John 1.29, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus not only offered the perfect sacrifice, he was the sacrifice, the perfect spotless lamb, slain for you and me. He bore our sins in his body. Our sin transferred to him. His righteousness transferred to us. What does all of this mean? It means that the sole path to experiencing the fullness of your humanity is through Jesus and Jesus alone. That Jesus and Jesus alone is how we experience God's presence dwelling with us. Jesus and Jesus alone is how we are empowered to live out our God-given purpose as prophets, priests, and kings. Jesus and Jesus alone is the one who can remove from us our guilt, our shame, and our fear. The Christian life then, it is this pilgrimage. It is a pilgrimage towards greater restoration. It is to accept that we've been beautifully designed, tragically flawed, yet radically redeemed by the blood of Jesus. To accept Christ is to in, in, in an instant be reconciled back to God. All the promises objectively become yours. Listen to what Peter declares is true of the Christ follower. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercies. Do you hear the echoes of everything that we've unpacked now beautifully applied to the church, applied to the Christ follower all in and through Jesus? That to accept Christ is to be restored back to this intimate dwelling with God, to be his kingdom of priests, to be commissioned by him, to be set apart, to declare his interests and his kingdom to the world around us. In an instant, you're forgiven, you're adopted, you're cleansed from sin, you're granted or imputed the righteousness of Jesus. And yet, in the day-to-day, we often fail to live out the things that God has objectively declared true. The image on screen, I think, captures this tension so well. That on the vertical, I want you to notice righteousness. And on the horizontal is time. And what it communicates is that by birth and of our own choosing, we've been born into sin. We've been born not having any righteousness of our own. To accept Christ is to, in an instant, go from zero to 100%. That is your position in Jesus. It is a position that cannot change. It is a position that cannot be lost. And yet, subjectively, in the day-to-day, -day, our condition is up and down. Growth in our humanity, then, is the convergence of those two lines. Growth in our humanity is us subjectively living out what God has objectively declared to be true of you in and through his son, Jesus. So the application for some, then, is claiming the righteousness of Christ for the very first time. It's abandoning any and all hope that you can fix yourself, clean yourself up, Present yourself holy and righteous before God. Application for others is, how can I live out with greater clarity what God has deemed so? In G.K. Beale and Mitchell Kim's book, God Dwells Among Us, they observe this. We look like what we look at. We look like what we look at. In other words, where we set our gaze, the gaze of our mind, the gaze of our attention, 
the gaze of our affections, our time, our intentionality, our, impri- our priorities, that is what will become. We look like what we look at. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? And what might it look like to reset your gaze upon Christ? To in greater measures look upon him so that the design of our humanity can be realized in greater depth and in greater clarity. Let me end with this. If you were to Google an image of Katie Piper today, here's what you'd find. That's her. You'd find that she did, in fact, marry. She has two kids. Her modeling career not only didn't end, but it took off. She launched the Katie Piper Foundation, whose aim is to help create a world where, so beautiful, scars do not limit a person's function, inclusion, or overall sense of well-being. Katie's been an advocate for victims. She's been a spokesperson for change. She's raised money. She's raised awareness. She has been a courageous voice for the marginalized. Her story is painful, but it is also beautiful. It is a beautiful picture of redemption, a picture that I believe Christ wants to paint on the canvas of your life and on mine as well. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for just the moments that we share this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. God, much of what we've covered today has not been easy. (laughs) Coming face to face with the reality of our sin coming face-to-face with the reality of our imperfection. I think instinctually, all of us, we want to be our own Savior, but we're not. God, we need you. Would you, in your grace and in your gentleness and in your kindness, make these truths evident, not just in our minds, but in our hearts as well. That for some who've never trusted you, They'd begin a relationship with you today. For others, they'd recognize the ways in which they're not living out what you, God, have objectively declared and purchased for them through your son. We love you. We pray all these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. Hey, one quick thing. I want to invite the prayer team to actually come up. And listen, if you need prayer, um, I just invite you to come forward. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you, and minister to you in that way.